Hey guys, Woodruff here. So now let's talk about iron deficient anemia. Um, so iron deficient anemia is a specific type of anemia that is a result of a patient not having enough of a certain nutrient that is needed to make red blood cells. And that nutrient, of course, is going to be iron. Um, so as you would think, if it's called iron deficient anemia, what would cause you to be deficient in iron? Well, if you're not taking in enough iron, or if you can't absorb iron for some reason, maybe you have absorb absorption issues, um, GI disorders, things like that. Um, people that have a general excessive blood loss also are usually low on iron um, or people that have conditions that can lead to hemolysis. So when you think of risk factors for this, um, you know, this is um, something that happens in countries that don't have good iron intake. It's more common in countries that uh, may not have the same um, nutrients and things like that we have available in America. Um, it's also women in the reproductive years because you have to think about them losing um, blood every month um, in their period, um, younger age, and a lot of that just has to do with the reproductive years and women and stuff again. Um, and then anyone who's had uh, has like malabsorptive uh, GI disorders um, or has had bypass surgery, they're not absorbing nutrients the same way that other people have the ability to. Um, so definitely want to um, keep them in mind as being at risk. So what does a patient with iron deficient anemia look like? So they may have no symptoms, depending on how severe their anemia is, or they can have those classic symptoms we talked about in general anemia, like they're pale, weak, tired. Um, you want to ask them about their breathing. Um, they may report that they're feeling short of breath. Um, you also maybe want to ask them about their pain because um, something that's very specific, and when you're looking at different types of anemia, you want to kind of break down what's different. Um, something that's specific to iron deficient anemia is going to be um, that they can have what's called glossitis, which is inflammation of the tongue or chelitis. I'm going to say that really bad. It's probably pronounced something very different, but it's inflammation of the lips. Um, so you want to see if there's any burning sensation on their tongue, lips, or if they have any headaches. Um, so that's what I'm going to ask about. Um, but what am I actually going to look with my eyes and assess? Um, I'm going to assess their mouth and tongue for those specific iron deficient anemia symptoms. And then also look at their respiratory status. You know, are they using any accessory muscles um, to, um, to breathe? What's their oxygen saturation? Things like that. So something that's big in cardiac in general, but especially in our anemias is you need to know your labs, like what your lab's going to be. Um, so you definitely want to know your normal hemoglobin, like I talked about in my last video, um, but you also want to know kind of like um, for a lot of the other ones, um, you know, what direction they're going in. Um, so um, for iron deficient anemia, as is because it's an anemia, of course, their hemoglobin is going to be low. Um, but then, so we look for signs of anemia. That's the first part. We also want to look at for signs of iron problems. So there's three main labs we look at for iron problems. First, it's actual serum iron. And of course, as the name would suggest, it's going to be low. There's also what's called ferritin. Um, and ferritin is a part of the iron storage process. And if I am low on iron, I'm not going to need to store as much iron. So my iron storage is going to be low. Um, the last one is a little bit confusing to some people, but I'll use my parking space analogy and see if it helps. Um, so there's storage for um, iron, but there's also these parking spaces for iron. Um, and what do you call it? Ferritin has more to do with the storage of iron itself, where um, think of this next thing, it's called TIBC or total iron binding capacity. This is something um, in the body that um, leaves places for iron to, you know, to bind to, like, you know, like pretty much the ability to bind to and to be used in the body. Um, so I like to think of these, they're not actual parking spaces, just for those, again, that um, I'm a very, I know that I can be, um, I can be taken very literal sometimes. They're not actual parking spaces, but I think of, if I think if you think of it this way, um, it might help you. So um, for the total iron binding capacity, it's going to be high compared, everything else is low low hemoglobin, low iron, low ferritin. Um, but with the, for the total iron binding capacity, this is actually going to be high. And the reason this is going to be high is, is because this is counting how many parking spaces are available. Um, so um, think of, uh, what do you call it? Um, I always compare it to uh, nursing school. At my nursing school, the parking is really rough for students. There's not a lot of spaces. 
Um, and that's because, um, you know, just like this would, um, uh, what do you call it, suggest when, like at the beginning of the semester, we have a whole lot of students. There's a lot of students coming in for clinical and other things. So when there's more students, there's more parking spaces that are being used. Um, but as the semester goes on, those students start going to clinical and other things. And also students stop showing up as the semester goes on. <laughs> and so what happens is um, we have less students. So because there's less students showing up, there's also more parking spaces available. And the same is true with iron. Um, so when we have more iron in our body, those parking spaces for the iron that are sitting here, they're like sitting there taking a spot. Hey, I'm ready to be utilized. There's going to be more of those parking spaces occupied because there's more iron in the body. But hey, if there's not iron around, they're not taking up those parking spaces. We're using every last drop in our body. Um, you know, we're not parking any of our iron like to save for later like you know it's it's being used because <laughs> we're so low on it so hopefully that makes sense but um effectively low iron low ferritin and then high total iron binding capacity so i have a high ability to bind or places to bind to because i am not using a lot of those spaces because all of my iron is in use because i'm low on it whereas my actual um you know storage of iron is going to be low and then my iron itself of course is going to be low we also can look for, um, because one of the um, common causes of iron deficient anemia is going to be blood loss, we also can look in their stool and other places where um, blood loss might be hiding. So sometimes we can tell a patient is bleeding, um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's hidden. So the the um, this test, a stool, a uh, stool stool occult blood. Occult means hidden. Um, and so sometimes I can look at a patient's stool, it's bright red or it's um, dark. And I'm like, hey, there could be blood in this, but sometimes it just looks normal. But then we go and test it to see if there's maybe like little bits of blood that have accumulated from the GI system. So um, this is another test we do because um, as much uh, kind of like what I was talking about with other uh, anemias, like I can go all day long and figure out um, that the patient has this type of anemia, but if I don't get to the bottom of the cause, it's not very helpful. So we're looking for signs of the anemia and the iron deficiency itself. And they're also looking for signs of causes of this type of anemia too. So what do we do medically to manage this? Um, we treat the cause. Um, so if, um, you know, if there is something that is uh, a reversible cause, we try to treat that. Um, they usually, this is not just where they're low on blood cells, they're also low on iron. So we need to replace iron. Um, it's good to know that they, uh, for some people, they might only need two or three months to replenish the iron, but it does take time. Um, just note that it's not an immediate thing. Um, so they may need two or three months to replenish the iron or some patients need lifelong therapy depending on their cause, especially if they have like an absorption, other issue. Um, if their anemia gets severe enough, they may need a blood transfusion. Remember, we usually only transfuse for less than seven. Um, and then uh, we're just going to support their oxygenation and breathing, like they're um, give them O2 as prescribed. Um, as uh, as the nurse, one of the medications, like I said, I'm going to give is iron supplementation. So there's some special teaching and other things around iron. Um, so uh, first, how do I know it worked? Well, um, when I'm looking at this, I'm going to probably look at my iron labs. The iron's going to go up. I'm going to look that ferritin to go up. I'm going to have less parking spaces because I have more iron. So more of the iron that I have now is taking up those parking spaces. Their breathing may be better. But overall, usually what we look at is the actual end measure, which is looking at um, whether their anemia is better. So I'm um, checking that hemoglobin that should be increased. Um, signs of a problem with the iron supplementation would be, you know, mostly it's just GI side effects. It's not always well tolerated. Um, it's preferred to be given via an oral route, but not everyone tolerates it well. Um, so it's usually going to be things like nausea, vomiting. All right, let's take a break to do a teaching focus question. Um, so a nurse is caring for a client with iron deficient anemia who is taking ferrous sulfate. This would require you to know that ferrous sulfate is another name for iron. Um, which assessment finding by the nurse needs to reported needs to be reported to the healthcare provider immediately? So this is saying like which of these will the patient die the quickest of if they don't um, you know get that treatment? So answer choice A says that they complain of nausea after taking ferrous sulfate. Well, one I think this is expected for them to have nausea. Um, but I can't imagine that this nausea would kill them the quickest. Um, and like, there's nothing necessarily like life or death happening here. They're having nausea. Okay. B is the client reports they notice blood in their stool. 
Well, definitely don't like that. Um, blood loss is usually something I do want to report. It might be minor. It could be something major. But usually if there's blood coming out of anyone's orifices, I'm usually telling somebody. So that's going to be top of my list right now. Let's keep going. The client reports black stools after taking their ferrous sulfate. Hmm. So if I didn't know that, I would probably, if I didn't know about this medicine, that sounds pretty scary. Um, but one of the interesting um effects of iron is that it can actually lead to black tar stools. So I think this is another one kind of like A where it's, um, you know, it's kind of expected for uh, the medication. And then D is client states they have not had a bowel movement in two days. Well, you know, I definitely want to make sure that this patient's not constipated and we're doing something for it. So if it was me, I'll get down to between B and D. Um, what's more scary, that they have blood in their stool or that they're constipated? Um, well, constipation is definitely something I want to do, but do I need to tell the provider immediately? Um, it's not necessarily life and death as compared to them having blood in their stool. So just know this, because a lot of times students would read this question and think that there has to be something that the ferrous sulfate is doing wrong. Um, they don't have blood in their stool because of the ferrous sulfate, but um, they have iron deficient anemia. And the reason they have that could be blood loss. So I need to report any blood loss. Maybe they have an active bleed or something else. Um, again, it's not related because they're taking the ferrous sulfate, um, but any sort of blood loss, I definitely want to report to the physician. All right. So yeah, so sorry. The correct answer is B. Um, so let's talk about some of this, bring it together with some of this teaching. So um, teaching for um, iron supplementation, we want to teach them to take their iron one hour before meals because um, we like them to have it on an empty stomach when possible. Now, this is not well tolerated on empty stomach by a lot of patients, but we want them to do their best to try to take it on an empty stomach. Um, we also want them to try to take the iron with vitamin C or orange juice for better absorption. And this is not say take it with um, vitamin C foods. We usually take it with vitamin C fluids um, or orange juice, and that allows for better absorption of the iron itself. Um, liquid iron can stain teeth. So usually like in this last um, thing here, see all this uh, black around the teeth? That is all about... Um, uh, staining from iron. I'll tell you also, if you ever give it IV, be super careful because it can stain the crap out of your scrubs um, or other things you might spill it on in the room. Not speaking from personal experience over here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so um, you want to give it diluted through a straw if you give it liquid. Um, want to educate patients on that some things may show up that look different, but they're not necessarily scary. So I'm going to tell them like, hey, you know, um, your stools may turn black and tarry. This is expected after your iron, um, uh, not to be concerned about that. Um, it helps to sit upright for 30 minutes after administration to decrease some of the GI distress that they might have um, or any sort of reflux. And then also to know that it can cause constipation. So like in that question, when it was saying they had constipation, I maybe need to call the doctor and tell them, hey, let's get a stool softener started if they don't have one. But it's not necessarily a life or death compared to the bleeding. Um, so um, constipation, change in stools, how to administer it if they're doing it liquid to make sure they don't stain their teeth. Um, and then just how to deal with some of the GI symptoms. That's a lot of what the teaching is focused around. So what do I do as the nurse for this patient? I'm going to keep their head of bed elevated um, in order to support a positive breathing pattern, um, doing the same, a lot of the same anemia stuff, the frequent assessments, the neurological and respiratory. You're going to see a lot of repetition here, but um, just kind of keep it in your mind. It's just reinforcing it as I hit myself in the face. Um, prevent and manage any sort of bleeding in the patient. Um, that's especially important for this one because blood loss can lead to iron loss. Um, regular blood pressure checks to make sure that they're not having a severe drop or loss in blood, um, teaching them those energy conservation techniques. And then um, aside from the education I've already mentioned for iron supplements, uh, we also want to teach them about increasing their intake of iron through food as well. Um, so some good dietary sources of iron are going to be things like beef, spinach, beans, shellfish, and there's even iron fortified pastas and iron fortified cereals um, that definitely help. Um, so even for you picky eaters, if you don't like pasta and cereal, then you've got a serious problem. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think that's all I've got for iron deficient anemia. See you for the next one.